So today I'm going to talk to you about Anton Yelchin, who was the young actor who died tragically in a uh, bizarre auto accident back in 2016. Guy's uh, been eight years already. And uh, he was a young guy, 27 years old, Fright Night, Alpha Dog, and uh, a lot of other things. The Star Trek, he, in the reboot of uh, Star Trek, he played Chekhov, uh, the Russian character, which was perfect because his family were from uh, the uh, Soviet Union. His mother and father were professional uh, figure skaters, and they defected to America when he was six months old. And he grew up in the San Fernando Valley. And well-liked individual, very well, t very talented you know, actor, and he was also a musician, and just an all-around nice guy. And he became very successful, and he bought himself a nice house in Studio City, that was built in 1940, 1,500 square feet, two bedroom, two bath, very close to his family. Uh, his mother and father and he were very, very close. And he's buried at Hollywood Forever Cemetery, and his parents devoted parents, uh, gosh, talk about just a master class in grief. It's so sad because they're there. One of the, one or two, either the, the mom or the dad, Mr. and Mrs. Yelchin are there almost every single day, uh, sitting in a chair by Anton Yelchin's grave. And it's just such a tragedy that eight years later, uh, I'm not saying they should get over it. It's not for me to say, but I'm just saying that it's quite obvious they're not. And they're so devoted and they're so heartbroken still. And understandably, uh, this, this accident was, was completely preventable, I think, and just a bizarre circumstance. Um, oh, he was also born with cystic fibrosis, which is a, uh, it affects your, your lungs, uh, and, and the life expectancy is different if you have cystic fibrosis. So in the evening of Saturday, June 19th of 2016, he left his home. He was going to attend a, a rehearsal of a band that he was in and the band was called Hammerheads and they were waiting for him. His bandmates were waiting for him to show up. It was around 11 o'clock in the evening. And he left the house, got in his Jeep. It was a 2015 Jeep Grand Cherokee. And he got in his Jeep and his house was on an incline. And so the driveway was a very, was a steep driveway to go up to the road. And he put his car at the park after he got up to the road and went back. I guess maybe he had to manually close his gate and the car wasn't in park and it rolled back and pinned him to the gate. So what I'm going to read to you now is his autopsy report. I got it from the uh, Los Angeles County Coroner, the medical examiner, they call it now. And this came in uh, last week. And I was curious about the details of it. And this, this will obviously uh, go into the, the facts about Anton Yelchin's death. And his, uh, how they, how he was discovered. And it's quite gra graphic because there's nothing, nothing you could see. It's quite detailed. And I'm going to spare you a lot of the, the jargon because people really come after me for that. But also there's not as much as I thought there would be. And I'll, I'll put these graphics into the, into the uh, video as I read these things. But what I'm mostly concerned with that I wanted to share with you was the report of what happened uh, from the detectives who filled out the form. And it's, it's kind of lengthy. So I will start out. This is uh, the decedent Anton Victor Yelchin. This is case number 2016-04493. Uh, informational information sources, verbal statements from one of the handling police officers and the incident number for this is da, 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 da. visual statements from the decedent's father, verbal statement. So the, the, that's the sources from the police officers and from his father. I'm not sure if the father and mother lived with him. Something tells me they might have since they were sort of on scene. But they were very, very close. So either way, they were, you know, within minutes of, of each other, I think. 
And the investigation, due to ongoing traffic collision investigation by the Handling Law Enforcement Agency, the information contained in this report is subject to change at any time. That's just a, a sort of disclaimer. On June 19, 2016, at approximately 2.04 a.m., uh, Officer Zelena, Officer uh, Zelaya of the LAPD Valley Traffic Division called the LA uh, County Department of Medical Examiner Coroner to report an accident-related death. He spoke to the uh, veteran intern Lopez on the phone. The officer reported that the decedent had been involved in a traffic collision. 911 has been dialed on the decedent's death. It was pronounced at the scene. There was no further information at that time. I assigned the, detect the detective uh, who filled this out uh, this field one case to myself at approximately 2.24 a.m. I responded to the Forensic Science Center at approximately 2.34 a.m. and I arrived at the scene at approximately 3 o'clock a.m. After completing my field investigation, I left the scene at approximately 4 a.m. and I returned to the Forensic Science Center at approximately 4.20 a.m. The forensic attendant, M. Gonzalez, transported the decedent from the scene and into the forensic science center. The location of the injury, the driveway of the residence, this is also noted as the location of the death, 3866 Barry Drive in Studio City, California, 91604. Now, this is the, uh, the detective. I spoke to the handling, one of the handling officers, Sergeant Whitmore, at the scene. The following is a summary of her statement. On June 16, 2016, sometime, sometime between the hours of 10.30 and 11.30, the decedent was scheduled to meet with his other band members, fellow band members, for a rehearsal. After a few hours had passed and the friends had not heard from him, they decided to drive to his residence to check on his welfare. At six on 6 20 16 june 20th 2016 at approximately 1 a.m the friends arrived at his residence they found the decedent quote pinned is the term in quotation between the rear end of his vehicle and a gate that was located on the driveway of his residence one of the friends dialed 911 for help at approximately 102 a.m so they got there at 1 a.m and called the police at approximately 2 1.02 a.m. And uh, they arrived, they were dispatched at the scene, sorry, okay. And they arrived at 1.10 a.m. So they got there in, in like eight minutes, which is pretty impressive because it's a hilly area. Uh, lots of winding, narrow roads up there. But again, at that time of night, uh, there wouldn't be that much traffic to be concerned with, I think. And they probably had their lights flashing, too. So there's a lot of blind curves. I, I doubt that they had, um, their, well, they certainly wouldn't have got their their uh, their sirens going. They may have had their lights on. I don't know. Uh, okay. So at approximately 102, officers with the L.A. Police Department, Valley Traffic Division were dispatched. Uh, the L.A. Fire Department Rescue Ambulance number 86 was also dispatched to the residence. Officers initially began arriving on the scene at approximately 1.10 a.m. Firefighter paramedics were already on the scene prior to the arrival of the officers, which is really impressive. The speed which they arrived is for such a hilly, uh, elevated area. So the firefighters, paramedics informed the officers that they initially discovered the, seat, the decedent pinned between the rear end of the vehicle and the gate as well. Before resuscitative uh, uh, measures were performed on the decedent, firefighter paramedics pushed the vehicle forward on the driveway. A fighter paramedic was then reported to have set the gear shifter into park and engaged the emergency park parking brake. The decedent was noted to have sustained obvious traumatic injuries to his chest area and head. Firefighter paramedic Redden pronounced the decedent's death at the scene at 1.10 a.m. The officers looked around the scene. They did not observe any indication of foul play. There were no prescription bottles, no illicit drug paraphernalia, or containers of alcoholic beverages inside the decedent's vehicle. That's something they just have to rule out immediately. At the time of my field investigation, the officers were not sure of any obvious mechanical defects in the vehicle. There were no observed tire friction marks or blood stains on the driveway. The officers observed what they believed to be recent defects 
next to the fence that was located along the west side of the driveway and to a brick wall that was located along the east side of the same driveway. So literally the gate, there was, it was pinned to the, you know, between the car, the car rolled back and pinned him against the gate and obviously hit the bricks there too. I took photographs not that long after the accident, so I'll put them in here and we'll see. I'm pretty sure that that, that damage is, is, uh, is visible on the photographs that I took. When the officer searched inside his residence, they didn't observe any apparent suspicious circumstances. The officers observed that the decedent's residence would mo was monitored by a security company. Therefore, they were attempting to retrieve any security footage of the incident at the time of the field investigation. At the time of the investigation at the scene, officers believed that the decedent may not have properly parked his vehicle before walking to the rear of his vehicle and eventually becoming in between the rear end of the vehicle and the gate. Now, this also says that the detective spoke to his father at the scene, and the following is a summary of the father's statement. Family members had last spoken to the decedent over the telephone on the 19th of June at approximately 10 p.m. During their tele telephone conversation, the decedent did not make any unusual statements and did not complain of any problems. Aside from cystic fibrosis, the decedent was not known to have any other significant medical problems. The problem was not known to impair his movement or driving abilities. The decedent was known to be compliant with his prescription medications for his medical problems. He was not known to have any psychological problems. The decedent was never, has never made any suicidal ideations and never attempted it in the past. He was employed as an actor and actively participated in a band that he had joined with other friends. The decedent was not known to abuse any prescription over the counter medications, illicit drugs, or alcohol. However, the decedent was known to smoke marijuana when he was younger. He was not known to currently smoke marijuana. The decedent was not known to have consumed any alcoholic beverages or prescription medications prior to his telephone conversation with family members. This is the scene description. The scene of death was the driveway located at the decedent's residence. The physical address, as I mentioned before, 3866 Berry Drive, Studio City, 91604. The residence is located east of the intersection of Berry Drive and Berry Court in a residential neighborhood. The driveway of the residence has a positive grade as well as a corresponding negative grade. There is a security gate separating the driveway from the rest of the residence. The surface of the driveway appeared to be composed mostly of concrete. At the time of my field investigation, it was dark outside and the weather felt warm. I viewed the vehicle that was involved at the scene. It was a black Jeep Grand Cherokee sports utility vehicle with the California license plate number, which was redacted. It was located at rest on the driveway of the residence. There were scratches along the right, the front right section of the vehicle. Its driver's side door was open and appeared to be displaced. There were scratches along the edges, as, uh, its edges as well. When I looked at the rear end of the vehicle, uh, it, I, was, uh, I was that its right tail light was damaged and displaced. Just wording. It's, it's, a, it's a typo, it's not me. The cover of the taillight appeared to be cracked. Overall, the exterior of the vehicle was dirty. When I looked inside the vehicle, I observed that the vehicle had been turned off. It had a push-button ignition. I had been informed by officers at the scene that the vehicle had been placed in park. The interior of the vehicle appeared dirty uh, overall as well. I saw musical equipment, loose change, chargers, and other miscellaneous items inside the vehicle. I was informed that officers had placed the decedent's wallet lying on the driver's seat of the vehicle exposed prior to my arrival at the scene. None of the airbags inside the vehicle had deployed. When I looked at the gate that was involved in the incident, I saw various scratches and dents on certain portions of it. The damaged portion of the right of the gate appeared to be closest to the rear right section of the vehicle. 
Officers informed me that they observed, quote, fresh damage to a west-aligned portion of the gate and east-aligned portion of the brick wall, which were located alongside uh, of the driveway that was closest to the main roadway of Berry Drive. There were various leaves and dirt covering the surface of the driveway. Now, fire, fire, firefighter paramedics initially discovered the decedent pinned between the right end of the vehicle and the, uh, the, the gate. After the decedent's death pronouncement, they placed the decedent lying on the driveway and covered the body with a white colored sheet. The decedent appeared to have been somewhat propped against a portion of a brick pillar, which was connected to the gate. The top of his head was pointed in a westerly direction and his face was pointed toward the driveway. His right arm was lying on the driveway and his left arm across his chest. The decedent's legs were outstretched and lying on the driveway. His clothing appeared dirty. A cracked taillight cover had been resting on the decedent's left shoulder area. I did not observe any weapons, projectiles, or suspicious objects on or around the decedent's body at the scene. And the detective says that he did not collect any evidence at the scene. Of the body examination, he says, I performed the decedent's external body examination for this field case at the scene. The decedent appeared to be an adult Caucasian male who appeared to be around the reported 27 years of age. He had short and straight blonde hair, short and dark beard and mustache, blue eyes, and all natural teeth. I examined the decedent as he was lying on the driveway at the scene. The decedent was dressed in a brown shirt, black pants, black underwear, black socks, black boots, and a black belt. Overall, his body appeared to be in fair condition. I began my external examination by looking at the anterior side of the decedent's body. When I examined the decedent's head, I saw various abrasions on his forehead and face. His tongue was protruding and appeared to be dehydrated. I looked at his chest and saw electrocardiogram patches on it. An electrocardiogram patch was also observed on his abdomen. There were abrasions along the left side of his chest. When I examined his arms, I saw abrasions on both of them as well. I looked at his legs and did not observe any apparent traumatic injuries. I turned the decedent's body over on the driveway and viewed his posterior side. When I examined the decedent's head, I did not see any other remarkable defects. I observed that his shirt had become wet with fluid that had emanated out of, this, out of the decedent's mouth while I was performing the body examination. I saw that some portions of his shirt were torn. I looked underneath these torn portions and saw apparent lesions and blood stains on the back and right shoulder area. I did not observe any other remarkable defects, scars, or tattoos on either side of the decedent's body at the scene. So, I don't know, it sounds like, I mean, if they look for all that, you know, shoulder and and uh, legs and everything, and didn't see any injuries, it, it sounds like they had his clothes off at the scene, which is interesting. I didn't know they'd do that. I mean, the body examination, shirt torn, I looked underneath. I didn't know nothing, uh, no tattoos on either side of his body. Hmm. I felt and observed for signs of rigor mortis on the decedent. Uh, decedent's body. I felt rigor mortis to be at the level of four to his jaw and a level of four to his neck and fingers, to a level of four on his wrists and ankles, a level of four to his elbows, a level of four to his shoulders and knees, a level of four to his hips, a level of four to his abdomen. I looked for signs of liver mortis over the de on the decedent's body. I saw liver mortis mostly on the posterior side of his body. The liver mortis on the portion of his body was fixed as it did not blanch easily when hard pressure was applied with my fingertips. So liver mortis is how the blood settles when someone dies. You know, like if you die laying flat, the blood, the blood since it's no longer circulating, kind of pools inside your body, but down. And as he was died when he was standing up, the blood would have pooled down uh, to his lower portion of his body. I did not take a liver temperature of the decedent as the time of when the decedent may have been last known to be alive prior to a scheduled rehearsal with his friends could be a 
approximated. At uh, 3 a.m., I visually and positively identified the decedent as Anton Victor Yelchin with the dirt birth date of March 11, 1989. I identified the decedent by comparing his face with a photograph that was on file for him at the California Department of Motor Vehicles Image Record Database. Next of kin notification redacted, but obviously this father was participating with the investigation. Uh, tissue donation. I did not approach the decedent's next of kin regarding organ tissue donation. Autopsy notification. I did not receive any examination notification request for this field case. And that was uh, the coroner investigator, Brian Kim. Hmm. So that wasn't a detective, but the coroner investigator. So it has the... Um, the synopsis. We're going over this again a little bit, but uh, this is the uh, the synopsis done by Sergeant White Wit Wit. At uh, June 18, 2016, the decedent, a 27-year-old Caucasian male, was supposed to meet with his fellow band members at a particular location. When he failed to meet them, they drove to his residence and discovered the decedent pinned between the rear end of his vehicle and a gate, which were located in the driveway of his residence and 911 was called. The LAPD, Valley Traffic Division, and the LA Fire Department responded to the scene. Firefighter paramedics moved the vehicle and opened the gate. They engaged the parking brake and set the vehicle into park. The decedent sustained obvious blunt force injuries to his head and chest. Firefighter paramedic Redden uh, pronounced the decedent's death at the uh, scene at 1.10 a.m. Officers did not observe any indications of foul play. It was believed that the decedent may have not properly parked his vehicle before walking to the rear of his vehicle. An investigation into the incident is continuing, but there are no reported observed suspicious circumstances. According to the decedent's father, the decedent was known to have cystic fibrosis. He didn't have any other significant medical problems. He didn't have any psychological problems. The decedent never made any intentions of harming himself, and he never attempted to do that in the past. He was known to smoke marijuana when he was younger, however, was not known to currently abuse any prescription, over-the-counter medications, illicit drugs, or alcohol. So that is the scene investigation. Those are the detectives, coroners, investigators. Those are the, the, um, the scene reports. Now, the internal exam in the autopsy report is not going to show much, much more than, I mean, well, I'll shut up because it's not for me to say. A 27-year-old male found to be pinned between the back of his vehicle and a driveway gate at his residence. Pronounced dead. History of cystic fibrosis. Autopsy findings. Blunt trauma. Facial neck abrasions, scalp, and surface contusions. Numerous abrasions. Pre-mortem. Several patterns located on the left chest. So that happened while he was still alive, while he was trapped there before he died. Left flank shoulders, back, upper extremities, and knees. Sterno... Uh, Sterno, sternoclavicular dislocation of fractures and bilateral upper rib fractures, no prominent hemothorax or pneumothorax. Uh, lung hyperinflation, except left upper fluid blood, dried protruding tongue tip. Lung changes consistent with cystic fibrosis. Okay, 69 inches tall. Embalmed, no. Approximately 139 pounds, 27 years old, liver mortis, blanching posterior. So they could touch it and it would change color. That's the blood settling. I would say the liver mortis. Uh, let's see. Blue eyes, no balding, curly hair. Uh, hemorrhages, no. Balding, no. Mustache, yes. Teeth, present, intact. Dentures, absent. Skin, um, the comment being blunt trauma. Medical intervention, intervention, none, because they weren't doing life-saving measures because it was clear they didn't need them. He'd been there long enough. Recent needle punctures, no. Scars, no. Tattoos, no. Deformities, no. Wrist scars, no. Uh, absent. And the other just says is the tip of his tongue uh, was protruding and was dry. 
blunt trauma with abrasions, several rectangular or irregular geometric, particularly on back. I'm a guess. I'm guessing that that is the fence that he was pinned against the slats of the fence. I think they, they, he was there long enough where they actually made marks in his body. Uh, Let's see, as diagrammed, internally rib, clavicle fractures, dislocation, spine and skull are intact. No prominent hemothorax or pneumothorax. There is evidence of thermal effect, particularly on some back and left forearm abrasions. Hot day, vehicle um, also got hot. And the gate, presumably hot, although it was 1 a.m. Focal, left chest, pectoral muscle, thermal effect, burns. So, okay, he when he when he was pinned there, he thought he put the car into park, and this 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 car had a design flaw. Well, they would they wouldn't call it a flaw. They thought they were being fancy. It ended up being a flaw. Uh, that when you when you put the the vehicle into park, you know how it feels. You know, it's it's sort of uh, you just I, I, that's why I never understood like vehicles now how you you dial it going you know into reverse. There's the dial as opposed to just the, the, the stick shift. And, and I'm used to driving. I've been driving, you know, for 40, 50 years or whatever it is. So I, um, so, you know, you used to, you just know how many latches it is, park and, and reverse and drive and lower gears. So in this design flaw, it would, the, the, the toggle or whatever you call it, you'd move it and it would, it would, it would like latch and it would still be loose. So it wasn't quite clear that it was being put into park. He put it into park or so he thought. And by all intents with this particular design, it makes sense that he thought it was in park, but it wasn't. As you can see, we're in park right now because the P is illuminated and the way to shift into reverse and then neutral and drive is just to push in the button and then click it through its three detents. Now that's pretty straightforward, but what's unusual is it snaps back to the center position like that. And then to shift back to park, I do the reverse, push in the button, go up to neutral, reverse, and then park. What's interesting to me is that it was, he was at the top of the steep driveway and he thought he put it into park and he had enough time to get out and go behind it and go to the gate and then the car rolled. So, that's what I, that's where I should kind of, I, I, I don't question anything like it couldn't have happened. I just try to figure the logistics of it. If he had parked it there, it took a while for it to, to dislodge from where it was parked and, and roll back onto him. So I don't quite understand that. And I said maybe he had an issue with the manual gate that he had to go back and check it or lock it or, or something like that. So. So, uh, let's see, no fractures, the tip of his tongue again dried, protrude, uh, protruding tongue, chest wall hemorrhage in relation to rib fractures. He had 10 cc, 150 cc's of food, no meds. This is all no, 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 no. Kid, right kidney weight, left kidney weight, bladder had 30 cc's of urine, uh, prostate checked, testes checked, thyroid checked, photographs were taken cultures were taken, toxicology taken. No, cultures were not taken. Toxicology was. X-rays, dental fillings, talks about dental fillings, clothing examination. No. Okay. The opinion of the county coroner, the medical examiner, death is attributed to blunt traumatic asphyxia. There are external blunt and internal blunt injuries. Though decedent did not appear to bleed to death, rather findings are consistent with the asphyxial mechanism of death, which may have included both respiratory or vascular compromise. Autopsy findings are consistent with circum circumstances and scene examination, pinned between the vehicle and gate, and the manner of death is accidental. Now, as best as I can figure, and this sounds so awful. What a torturous way to die. He is, um, he, so he, as he, this thing pinned him, he couldn't breathe. He was, he like couldn't, couldn't breathe. He could not expand his, his chest. That's what it sounds like to me. Like he was stuck there. The car was pinned against him in such a way that his like lung, lungs couldn't expand. He could not breathe. 
and he literally just sat there. The vehicle was running and he was trapped and he couldn't breathe. And that just sounds like, so, I don't know how long it took him to die. That sounds so awful. There are other ways. If you had a choice, you'd go. That just so, so sounds so, 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 so very terrible, tortuous. No alcohol, no cocaine, uh, no marijuana, no methamphetamine, no opiates, codeine, morphine, no hydrocodone, hydromorphone, none of that. There was nothing in his system. No, nothing altering his physical or mental. But this, now it shows, it's, this is the diagram of his head. And I'm not going to read all of this because I really can't. And the other thing, I'll put this up there so you can have a look at it. This other, I mean, there's so many details on this, on this page. It has brown hair, ball, uh, brown hair, three to four inches max, goatee, stubbly short beard. This is, this is not just injuries. It meant it's almost everything. The truck, the tongue protruding again. There's more to me yellow. And it has, remember I was telling you about those marks. It looks as if these marks are from the gate behind him, pinned against the gate and not being able to breathe. It's so awful. Yeah, he had burns. So he, he probably, yeah, he had, it looks like he had thermal burns. Yeah. On his, on the back of him, which, which is interesting if it was 11 o'clock at night and, and it just seems like that's, to get burned for that. And that's on his back. So that would have been what pinned him. So they're saying that it might've been the gate, but, <clears throat> but that would have been really late. So I don't, that's fascinating. Thermal burns on his back. That's, I can't quite figure that out. Cause I would think, you know, if the car, if the car didn't back into him, like if it was the front, I could see the burns because the engine would be running and your hands might touch it. But on the back, that's fascinating to me. Hmm. Well, I'm sure that there's an explanation for that. It's an explanation that I am not, uh, not familiar with, but I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about, about the Yelchins and what happened afterwards. So It was a 2.5 ton vehicle that rolled backwards and pinned him against the brick. After, uh, after his death, yeah, there's no knowing how long he was there for, for several hours dead. The Jeep's engine was still running. Fans came afterwards and left flowers at the gate. Three months prior. Okay. This is the thing that's interesting. Three months prior to the incident, this particular model of Jeep Cherokee was recalled because of the gear shift. So it was, it was confusing. It could be confusing to the driver as to which gear it's in, which explains it. The driver would think that the car is in park when it actually wasn't in park. Death ruled accidental, buried at Hollywood forever to, with a very fairly, a fairly, very fairly, a fairly modest marker memorial grave marker on his, it just said his, his name. Now, what's really interesting is that he was in a show, a movie, three years before he died called Burying the X. This is in 2014. Some of the scenes were filmed inside Hollywood Forever Cemetery. And bizarrely, in behind him, in the, one of the scenes you see, you see him in, is his own, where his own grave was going to be which is really weird when someone say, you know, your own grave, walking over your own grave or something like that. Um, it's quite possible that he did walk over his own grave, which is, which is mind blowing. So the, um, th they had recalled the Jeep for this concern in April of 2016, but the software patch to the vehicle did not reach the dealers until the week of Anton Yelchin's death. They could not establish if he actually got the recall at that point. And I don't think they ever did, but they did check through Anton Yelchin's mail, his papers, looking for that recall, probably having to do with the lawsuit. But 
because there was ob obviously a lawsuit. Mr. and Mrs. Yelchin sued Chrysler Fiat for wrongful death for this very reason. And it makes complete sense. Not necessarily, and they said this, you know, quite, they clarify, we weren't doing it for the money. We we're doing it to make sure that no, this didn't happen to some other family because it tore them apart. It was, he was their only son. He was their only child. And as I say, they still grieve. They're there every single day. And they're very kind. I mean, I've never, people don't bother them usually, but we know why they're there. And I, I happened to be there a few times while they were there and said hello to them. And they, you know, no, no eye contact, just friendly hello. And, uh, you know, we should just leave them alone. But sometimes like, you're right there and it's sort of uncomfortable to, you know, not say anything. So they, they're always very, very kind. Anyway, so I'll say... Um, that the lawsuit was settled out of court with Chrysler Fiat. And I believe that they took any money and they established sort of an Anton Yelchin fund. Maybe it's for cystic fibrosis. I forget what that is. I forget what the fund benefits, but um, they always said it wasn't for, they weren't doing it for financial gain, but they, they made it into a charitable Anton Yelchin sort of charity. So anyway, he was at this modest grave, uh, buried at Hollywood Forever Cemetery. And then October 8th of 2017, they unveiled a statue, a life-size statue of Anton Yelchin at his grave. The day of the ceremony was, it was really kind of bizarre because the, the there was Anton's statue. It had been covered up and there were signs all over it for weeks saying, or for days saying, please don't, you know, touch the sheet because there's going to be this unveiling and, uh, invited people or, you know, had, uh, had spoke at the thing and then they did this unveiling. But before they did, it was around, it was covered with this cloth and it was just so bizarre to see on the side of the, uh, the lake at Hollywood forever. But they, they unveiled this spectacular, statue, life-size statue of their son, Anton Yelchin, which now stands uh, at his grave at Hollywood Forever Cemetery. And hopefully no one else will go in a way like that. Um, it's just awful to think that you can't breathe, you can't expand your chest, so you're just like, oh, it just sounds so, so very, very awful. Um, so that's that's the story of Anton Yelchin, uh, talented guy, well-liked guy, and died tragically, and I hope it doesn't happen again. So rest in peace, Anton Yelchin. And thank you guys for watching. Thank you very much for your time, for your attention. And until next time. You heard me.